Mr. Clerk, call the roll. Thompson. Here. Masterson. Here. Gray. Here. Jerome. Here. Mulligan. Here. Stothard. Here. Mr. President. Here. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for the invocation? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lord, we ask you that you please be with the families of two of our council staff members, Rod Austin and Jim Dowding as they mourn the loss of their father-in-law and father, respectively. And we also pray with joy and thankfulness for your mercy to us as we begin our earthly work. Amen. Amen. City clerk certifies, City clerk certifies publication in the daily record on September 24th, notice we're pre-council and a regular city council meeting September 28, 2010. A current copy of the Open Meetings Act is posted in the white binder on the east wall of the legislative chambers. If you have a cell phone or, and or pager, we ask that you turn it off or to vibrate, please. Mr. Clerk, first item. Zoning ordinance on the final reading plan board attachments. Item number five, ordinance to rezone property located northeast of 30th and Bonderson Streets from GI to R4 single family residential district high density. A planning board and planning department recommend approval. Public hearing on item number five begins now. Are there any proponents? Any opponents? Public hearing's closed. Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's passed seven to zero. We'll take items six through nine. It's all one case. Six is ordinance to rezone property located southeast of Highway 133 and Pawnee Road from AG to DR Development Reserve District. A planning board and planning department recommend approval. Seven is a resolution of the plat entitled Northwest Bible Fellowship is hereby approved. A planning board and planning department recommend approval. Eight is a subdivision agreement is hereby approved. And nine is resolution of special use permit application to allow a religious assembly in a DR Development Reserve District is hereby approved. A planning board and planning department recommend approval. Public hearing on items six through nine begin now. Are there any proponents? Any opponents? Public hearing's closed. Move Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's passed seven to zero. A resolution, very permanent preliminary plat. Item number 10, resolution of the preliminary plat entitled the Ridges Replat 9, located northeast of 192nd and West Center Road, along with attached conditions, hereby accepting the preparation of final plat is hereby authorized here. A, Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing on item number 10 begins now. Are there any proponents? Any opponents? Public hearing's closed. Move the approval. Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Adopted 7 to 0. Pursuant to City Council Rule 7H, due to no meeting being held October 12th, agenda item number 11 should be laid over three weeks for publication and public hearing. Liquor item number 12. Woolner's Midtown Grocery in Delhi, 3325 Dodge Street. Class C liquor license, no application, new location. We would need an amendment to this to correct the address to 3253 Dodge Street. Second. Roll call. This is on the amendment. Amendment only. Thompson? Yes. We can have the public hearing after you do that. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's now amended. Public hearing on item number 12 begins now. Are there any proponents? Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the council, I'm Howard Epstein with Marks, Claire, and Richards Law Firm representing Walner's Midtown Grocery and Deli LLC. And with me is Mike Schwartz, the uh, owner of the business. And we uh, ask that you grant the resolution uh, adopting the uh, liquor license as amended. Roll call. Do you want to see if there's any opponents here first? Oh, that would help, wouldn't it? Yeah. Are there any opponents? It's really a good place. I know it is. 
Public hearing is closed. We have a motion and a second. No lights, roll call. As amended. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's adopted as amended, 7-0. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take items 13 and 14. They're together. It's uh, 94, 95 grill at 178, 57 Pierce Plaza. It's class I liquor license, no application, no location. Uh, 14 is the same applicant, the same location for a catering liquor license. Public hearing on items 13 and 14 begin now. Are there any proponents? <clears throat> Name and address. Hi, George Bezik, my wife Kim, part of uh, DCGK LLC. Um, recently purchased. Recently purchased 9495. Your address, please. Um, of the place or our home? Either one. 17857 Pierce Plaza. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Any opponents? Public hearings closed. Mr. Thompson? Thank you. Uh, any significance to the uh, name, 9495? It represents back-to-back -back championship. Uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. We like to think of only the Huskers, but it does. <laughs> does cross borders. All right, thank you. Sports. I move the approval. Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's adopted 7-0. Thank, thank you. you. Item number 15, the 8th note, 3922 Ames Avenue, a Class I liquor license and application, old location. Public hearing on item number 15 begins now. Are there any proponents? Uh, Karen Jenkins. Uh, the address is 3922 Ames Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and this is... Um, Lindsay DeBerry, 3922 Ames Avenue. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Any opponents? Public hearings closed. Mr. Gray. Um, thank you, Mr. President. First of all, um, I, my condolences and sorry for your loss. Um, secondly, you, are you ready to do this? Yes, I am, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I just wanted to I just wanted to tell you that, and um, you know, it's a little bit different business. So I hope you're ready for it, and uh, I'll be I'll be doing the best I can to support you in every every venue and every effort that I can. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Motion approved. Second. Roll call. Thompson. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Jerem. Yes. Mulligan. Yes. Stothard. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. It's adopted 7 to 0. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take items 16 through 18. They're all uh, satellite Kino locations. 16 is resolution that Big Red is authorized to operate a satellite Kino location at Big Jake's 3802 L Street, 17 at DJ Dugout, uh, 1003, 1009 Capitol Avenue, and Rocky's Bar and Grill at 1702 North 120th Streets. Public hearing on items 16 through 18 begin now. Are there any proponents? Yes, Mr. President, members of the council. My name is Katrina Coffey. I'm vice president of marketing for Big Red Kino. We're located at 11248 John Gulf Boulevard. I have with me all the owners for the applications that are before you. And we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Any opponents? Public hearings closed. Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. They're all adopted 7 to 0. Thank you. Consent agenda. Any member of the City Council may cause an item placed on the consent agenda to be removed. Mm. Items removed from consent agenda shall be taken up by the City Council immediately following consent agenda in the order in which they were removed unless otherwise provided by City Council rules of order. Uh, on the ordinances, there's been a request by the council president to remove item number 22 from the consent agenda. Public hearings on agenda items number 19 through 21 and 23 through 26 uh, were held on September 21st. We have a motion. Motion approved. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. They're all passed 7 to 0. Uh, 
we need to read that one up. Let's do the rest of the cons – well, let, we can take that one now. Item 22 is an ordinance to transfer funds and uncovered balance of the 2011 budget from other budgetary accounts, wage adjustments to the police department. Uh, let's see. Mr. Gray, would you? I didn't have my list. Yeah, I'd like to amend section 20. Uh, number uh, 20, is it 22? Yes. Okay, amend 22. This resolution clarifies the council's intent in adopting the 2011 fire department budget. It disclaims any commitment or endorsement of the goals and policies described in the proposed fire department budget. It further directs that the, the publicity available uh, information on the adopted fire department budget must provide this information this year and in the future. Second. This is the police. Um, wage adjustment counts, not fire. Yes, please. I believe. Is that accurate? The amendment is the. Oh. Yeah, first. Yes. Line. Oh, the first. I'm sorry. Yes. This transfer will be shown as all other similar transfers have been shown in the past. The police department budget pages, as well as the, de the department budget pages, including the fire department, will be in the 2010 format for the recommended and adopted budgets, which, com which complies with budget resolution 1012, adopted August 24, 2010. And is that to renumber section three That's to section number four, yeah, Mr. Gray? Re renumber section three to section four. Uh, and that's a sec uh, form of a motion. I'll second. That's a motion. Uh, no further lights. Uh, roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerome? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. The amendment's adopted. As amended? Second. second. No lights. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerome? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President. Yes. It's adopted as amended 7 to 0. Okay. We are now. Next resolutions. Page. Next page. Next page. Next page. Consent agenda resolutions. Okay. Public hearings on agenda items number 27 and 29 through 40 begin now. Are there any proponents? Number 27 and 29 through 40. Any proponents? Any opponents? Public hearings closed. Move the approval. Second. Roll call. This is item 29, 27, 29 through 40. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerome? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. They're all adopted 7 to 0. Now, item number 28 is resolution of the Professional Services Agreement with the URS Corporation for Project Management of Preliminary Design Services for the Separation of Sewers and Detention Basin Improvements in the Menelusa Basin is hereby approved. Public hearing on item number 28 begins now. Are there any proponents? Any opponents? Public hearings closed. Mr. Gray? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Marty, if you could come up, please. Um, we, had, we had a brief discussion, and I, and I want to get a couple of things on the record here just so that we are we're aware this is a large project. And as we have talked about, you know, we want to make sure that there are a variety of folks that are, that are taking part in this so that, you know, that there's not that the majority of the dollars are not being had by a few people and we continue to address the economic issues, uh, continue to not address the economic problems that a number of people have in the community. And I just wanted to get us, you know, hear from you on the record that we are proceeding the way we need to be proceeding, getting as many uh, uh, businesses and other uh, companies involved as long as it makes sense. I wanted to hear some of that comment from you. That, that's right. Uh, Murray Great Public Works. 
Um, we did put together, or we had our consultant uh, that formed the team that was selected for this, put together a package that showed the efforts that they made to include smaller businesses in this program, and I'll share that with you afterwards. But I also took some time to look. We've awarded a number of projects for engineering and design and study on sewer separation and the bigger CSO program. And I just did a quick look at the number of firms that are either under contract or subcontract on our program, and it's nearly 40 now. So it certainly isn't the case that there's two or three firms that are getting all the work. Okay. Uh, we are able to provide opportunities to a n number of consultants now to work on this program. Okay. The process we employ to do that, uh, it, it isn't we go down the list one at a time. It's all qualifications-based selection processes. And in fact, the law requires us to go through those processes. So there are some cases where some folks haven't been able to compete as successfully or haven't got on a team that was successful. But by and large, I think by this stage in the game, we're doing a pretty good job of, of distributing that work out so we keep everybody busy. For all those who may be interested in, 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 in participating and, and really not sure how to do that, this is a team concept. Explain that a little bit so that people are aware of it. Yeah. When we go through these processes, we develop a, a request for proposals and say, okay, this is the work we've had to do. Show how your experience and the experience of the folks that are going to be participating make you well qualified. And so they give us a written proposal, and then in a larger contract, we actually go through interviews of a short list. And frequently what we see is the teams that are successful they do the best job of picking maybe some national expertise for those very uh, uh, particular parts of the program that require it. But they also include a lot of local knowledge, which helps them work efficiently because they know where 42nd Street is and they know what Ames looks like. And so they can be more efficient than somebody coming in from the outside. And so what really occurs in most cases is we get the best team of local talent and national expertise to come together in the right amounts and with the right emphases, and that's that's how people normally win. And we normally go through, you normally go through, you go through the normal processes, let me say, of, of making sure that people are aware when these jobs come up and they have the opportunity to bid. Right, right. Um, we, we maintain a website that announces well in advance, you know, when these are available for, for uh, proposals, and then there's a, a set timeline that we go by. Okay. One of the things that we've also been doing with some of these uh, larger projects is after the firm or the team of firm is is, is uh, selected, then we'll go through another time and look and see if there might be parts of the work that could be taken out or add to that team with some of the, the participants on our emerging and small business list. So that's another step that we add in case they didn't really get in on the team, there's still an opportunity to look, look for them to get in. Okay, so there's a the constant session. look yes. at those, in those areas so that more people are in, engaged in that process. <laughs> that's of, correct. Okay. Thank you, Marty. I appreciate it. Um, motion approved. Second. No further lights. Roll call. Thompson. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Jerem. Yes. Mulligan. Yes. Stothard. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. It's adopted 7 to 0. Now, item number 41 is ordinance to amend chapter 10 by deleting section 10 146, contract for private fire, ambulance, and hazardous material services. A's of communication. Public hearing was held on September. 21st. Uh, Mrs. Stothard. Thank you. And uh, just once again, for the record, I um, want to let just make the statement that this is not about privatizing any part of the Omaha Fire Department or EMS. Um, this is about the contracts. In fact, in city code, it's under the section that deals with contracts. And uh, this uh, language in this contract basically says any contract, no matter how small, um, uh, it, and for any private, non-governmental person, firm, corporation, regardless of whether such service is to be performed within or without the city, cannot uh, be done unless there's super majority approval of the city council. Uh, the deletion of this ordinance just allows this department, the fire department, to have the same authority as any other department in the city, including the Omaha Police Department, and that they would be able to execute a contract of $20,000 or less without city council approval. And if the contract is $20,000 or more, it would still require a, a, a majority, a four-vote majority of the city council like every other department. Um, some good examples, as I said before, the Omaha Police Department does not have it in code, and it is a city-run department. It always has been, and it probably always will be. Um, but however, if you want to use another example, public works, 
Last winter, the public works director was to able to contract some private companies out to plow snow temporarily without coming to city council for a supermajority or even a vote. They had that authority to do so. So this just allows the fire department and the fire chief to have the same authority as any other department does. Um, the uh, couple comments that were made last week about the 200 major cities in the, across the country that have a city-run fire department, and um, you know, hopefully ours will always remain that way also. Um, but of those 200 fire departments, we couldn't find any that actually has it in their code and has it in their code that it can't be changed without a supermajority vote. So what we're trying to do is just treat everybody fairly and equally and uh, give the fire department the same leverage with their contracts as any other department does in the city. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Gray. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Someone from the fire department can come up, please. Representative from the fire department. Tim Book, Omaha Fire Department. Chief, tell me, give me your, give, give me your best argument for why this, why you think this should be in code. I mean, when, when the, the fire department is the only one that has this in, in, in code and the other departments don't. Well, you've caught me a little flat-footed. I was here to talk about uh, item number 49, okay. but uh, I was not around when the supermajority was voted in. Um, so I don't have a whole lot of information on that, and being unprepared today, I don't have a whole lot of information I can give you as far as voting the supermajority down, and that's your question, correct? Yes. The question is not about privatization. No. But just voting the supermajority down. Yes. Yes. I don't have a whole lot of information on that for you. Is there anything specifically I could answer for you? Well, I just want to know why, the, why, why you think it should be there. Why, what, what, is the, what is the argument for keeping it in when all the other departments don't have it? Um, I would have to go back and look at the reasons that it was put in in the first place, and I can't remember how many years ago that was, 10, 10 12 years ago. So I don't have the information on why it was put in at that time. It would be hard for me to give you an inf information about okay. what, what occurred at that time, at this point in time. Okay. All right. Thank you. Just a couple of comments, just, just very quickly. Um, well, let me yield the floor and maybe come back. Mr. Uh, Council Member Thompson wants to. Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Uh, I have three reasons why I would like to solicit support from my colleagues. Number one, I believe it's good government. It's good government to go back and clean things up that are burdensome that are kind of like stumbling blocks in the process of a uh, smooth process. And over the last 10 years, we've been doing that step by step. This is just another step in an overall efficiency process. Uh, number two, I think it takes the politics out of uh, the negotiation process. It just it makes it a, a level playing field. And uh, there's, no, there's no politics involved. There's no... Um, uh, a reason to to try and and link a person's vote up on the council with how much, let's say for example, how much uh, support you've gotten during the uh, election. I just think when it's clean like that, the individuals out in this in the in the uh, audience and then throughout the community appreciate that kind of a transparency. And then number three, uh, I think it promotes fairness and a balance, a sense of balance where all the departments feel that they're on. Um, dealing with the same kind of rules and that you don't have special rules for one department as opposed to another. So with that, uh, I, I'd like to vote on this today, and I want to yield the floor and hear what others have to say about that. Um, but I ask for your support and, uh, if possible, a 7-0 vote. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Mr. Gray? Thank you, Mr. President. Just a couple of comments. First of all, um, the feeling, there, there has been a feeling that, that this is politically motivated. I don't believe that it is. Um, and I do believe that it, that it falls within the category of what we did earlier last year when, when we took on the issue of minimum manning. Um, no other departments have this, so I, you know, I, I, I wish there had been someone here that could give me an answer as to, you know, what the reasoning was behind it, what the thought process was behind it, uh, because I, I have some serious issues with I know when it was introduced, I know who introduced it, and, and, and for that very reason I have some issues with, with that in and of itself. But this is not, in my judgment, politically motivated, nor 
uh, is it any attempt to privatize, nor would it be any attempt, and I would never support any attempt from what I hear in the background, just background noise from people talking about union busting and those sorts of things. I would never be in favor or support of anything like that. I would never be in support of privatization. Uh, but I am in support of, of, uh, of, of good government and, um, and, and making sure that the playing field is level for all departments. And, and um, those are just my comments, Mr. President. Thank you. This morning during pre-council, I had the opportunity to just to share uh, my appeal to my colleagues. Uh, uh, sort of at length, I will not go into uh, a very lengthy discussion other than to uh, let those in the audience and out in TV land know that uh, uh, are we at sensitive times uh, with uh, other things that are happening in government? Uh, yes, we are. And I appeal to my colleagues to um, lay this thing over for at least four weeks to allow the sensitive things that are happening um, in and out of uh, this particular facility and others, but within the global arena, arena of, of good government to, to proceed. Um, I don't know how successful that appeal was. Uh, we'll find out uh, when there is a, is a vote. Uh, again, I appreciate the information that was provided by both the local and the international to concerns that I have, and I, I would hope that uh, my colleagues got uh, uh, all of their questions answered as well. Uh, one of the things in, in reading a very large document here um, gave me the sense that they're actually in uh, support of what we're trying to do language-wise here. Um, we're not, we're, it was mentioned uh, that we were comparing apples to oranges uh, uh, during the uh, uh, last, during the public hearing on this. So if we're on Apple Highway and all of a sudden we have a grapefruit off-ramp that it seems that this was supposedly taking us to uh, and there's no on-ramps back up to uh, the issue that we're dealing with. There's nobody here that I know of on this council that is suggesting privatizing anything. I don't want an 18-hour certified individual working on me when I know that there's a 285-hour certified firefighter, paramedic, or EMT that can get there within four minutes and work on me or, or, or anybody that, that needs assistance. So with that said, uh, Mr. Weaver, I don't think there's anybody here from purchasing department, is there? Warren Weaver, City Council staff. I don't. I don't see anybody. Uh, to your knowledge, sir, is there anything currently or in the pipeline of privatizing anything within the fire department? No, not at all. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. To me, when the appeal was made uh, during the public hearing by. Uh, those that feel that this is the first step in privatization. I respectfully disagree with that because it begs to the question, as I've mentioned before, about taking that off-ramp and taking us off the main road in which this particular amendment is dealing with. And is there any member of the, uh, of the fire union here that could come forward? spokesperson. Darren Darian, Local 385-6005 Grover. Thank you for coming down. Um, I believe you spoke before. I have uh, on various Various items. topics? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. I did not last week on, right. on this. Is it still the feeling that there's going to be some reduction in service if this particular amendment is passed, 
explain to me how that would be possible that's the only one that's the only that's one of two questions that i still need to have answered we feel it's it is the first step towards privatization if you have the super majority to go that direction then you are definitively going to move that direction and we just feel take privatizing out of the the equation okay and just focus on the removal of that language how is that going to cause a reduction in service sir if you remove that language the service it, it's not a service reduction. It is basically you're removing the language of the supermajority. Okay. Correct? I mean, is that what you're asking? That's, yes. Okay. So it's, it, but it's your feeling that, or the, or the uh, those that are not in favor of this, the opposition, that if this language was taken out, there would be a reduction in service? That's the, the feel of the opposition? It, it is a, a movement that could go that direction. Um, it has not gone that direction and has been in place for years and just curious as to uh, all of a sudden now uh, the reasoning behind um, the reduction of the supermajority. Um, we, f- we feel strongly that if you go down that direction, you would have a supermajority. Okay. I, I said I had to two questions. Okay. Okay, that was number one. Thank you for that. Number two. Um, this is nothing personal, but why do you need protection from yourself? It just seems to me that you're talking about protection, about yourselves and what you do. Why do you need protection from yourself I, if with, I, this, with this ordinance? I'm not sure exactly what, what you're trying to... What, what the question is. Okay. All right, no, and that's a fair answer. I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'd like to uh, be able to, to answer it if uh, I knew go, exactly. Go right ahead. Well, right I guess ahead. I'm not I, sure what, how you feel or protection from ourselves. I mean, we feel that we provide the best service to the citizens of Omaha, and we feel that by, like I said, the first step of potentially privatiza- privatization or going down that path, um, we are providing the best service as we sit right now for the citizens. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, and just in my ending my remarks, uh, I believe the international uh, representative that came up um, stated that they even admit that uh, there could be uh, managerial problems, whether there's privatizing or even if it's left as is. That's how I understood that statement. Well, if you if privatizing happened, it would seem by the documents that were given to us that we would be compounding. So I don't see anybody in wanting to do due diligence and having good policy and good government would step forward and make an offer to privatize. I, sh- I know that I would. I would not want to put that in there. But we also have to have a level playing field for all of the departments in, in the city. So that's uh, where I am. And I think, oh, we have a couple of more lights. Mr. Thompson? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'll keep it short. I just want to reiterate that um, as being one of the co-sponsors of the Matrix Report back in 2007, a document which I really believe in, that document says that uh, privatization is something that they did not recommend. Again, I would be a hypocrite for being a proponent of the Matrix Report and then turn around and just try to pull one piece out and say, except for. Um, so I, I'm going to go by that recommendation that that's one of the least things we ought to do. And then I'm also a big proponent of performance-based um, type of uh, why you're in existence, to justify why you're in existence. And I believe just like um, the uh, police department, they are able to get things done and, and be a certain way because of the job that they do, not because of an artificial crutch that's uh, codified. And so I'd like to say that uh, 
as we uh, build our city that we need to look at taking away those artificial crutches. And I'd like for all of our, our departments, not just some of them, but all of them to be performance based. And the things that you get are based on, upon what you do, not, not because of something that you can use as a leverage against a council. And um, I'm not sure whether that would or would not be done, but in the past, in other areas, I, I do feel that leveraging was done in, in a way that was not uh, congruent to having good government. So with that, I'd like to move the approval of number 41 and hope I get a second. You can still ask. Because it's going to be Uh, the the chair would also recognize uh, a substitute motion to uh, lay over for four weeks. If someone wants to make it. Uh, um, Mrs. Stothard, next slide. Just a, a quick comment to wrap up. Um, the city charter was written in Omaha in 1956, and at that time a city-run fire department and police department was established. And until this day, we still have a city-run police department without an ordinance. And in 1997 is when the ordinance was written um, that we are talking about today. So that means for 41 years, our city ran with a city-run police de or fire department without it being an ordinance. And, and again, like I said, I'm, I'm assuming that it will continue to be that way um, for a good long time. But this is more about, about fairness and about treating every department the same and allowing the same authority that other departments have. And as I said before, to execute a contract at 20000 or less without city council approval. And with this section still in ordinance, they can't do that. They can't do a $10 contract without city council approval. So again, I, I want to stress this is about good government and good policy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no further lights. Um, the substitute motion uh, wasn't didn't fail made. for lack of a second. Didn't didn't get made, didn't. and it didn't get made. <laughs> and we have a motion and to uh, approve. Uh, Mr. Gray, um, Mr. President, this is a, a deal that I that I thought long and hard about, and um, there there is some. I think you and I would like to see it um, <laughs> laid over for, for four weeks, but I think the consensus, just as I've talked to other council members, would like to just get this thing done today. Um, I have wrestled with it back and forth. Uh, my vote today is not going to be a reflection on, on whether we privatize or not. My vote today is not going to be a reflection on the fire department, but it would be a reflection of you know, what potentially, what I think is going to be good government and leveling the playing field. So. Um, that's kind of the reason why I didn't introduce it, and um, I just think we probably ought to just move forward, Mr. President. Uh, we'll talk later. We'll definitely. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a motion and a second to uh, approve item number 41, Mr. Clerk. Yes, we do. Sir. No further lights. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? No. Gray? Yes. Jerem? No. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's adopted on a 5-2 to two vote. Or it's passed on a 5-2 to two vote. Uh, item number 42, ordinance to amend Chapter 13 to add prohibition of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender expression, and gender identification within the City of Omaha and the, in City of Omaha contracts. The public hearing was held on September 21st. Mr. Gray? Mr. Endenbosch, if I could have you come down, please. Bernard Indenbosch, Assistant City Attorney. Um, we, we put together a task force last week to take a look at, you know, making sure that our language was clean. And I know that some of the language that you have sent to me has, you know, has since been, you know, utilized and updated a little bit. Are we, are we moving along towards the track? I promised to lay this over about four weeks, and I want to maintain that promise as long as it looks like we're moving in the right direction. Uh, we did meet last Friday for approximately an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, had a dialogue with... 
the chamber was present as well as uh, representative of the business owners as well as a representative of the various groups that were in support of of the ordinance um, there was a suggestion that there would that we amend uh, some of the definitional language uh, I went ahead and prepared an amendment circulated it for everybody I've heard back from some people have not heard back from others but I know there's discussion so I uh, there was a meeting uh, there is discussion occurring uh, I know from as we left the meeting I think the chamber was desirous of taking the new language and, and interacting with its members and uh, and talking to them and trying to get some consensus and there were offers to them if there was a need for any educational uh, programs or forums or information uh, that that would be provided to them or their members uh, at their uh, wish and, and would be done promptly so at this point yes after the meeting there was some positive dialogue uh, there is an amendment that's been prepared uh, I haven't it's submitted it to you yet because I haven't heard back from all the players uh, okay. and, and if it's laid over and everybody's in favor of it I would bring forth at least that particular amendment and who knows there may be some other things that come out of the discussions okay well um, as long as people are not trying to hold it up because I'm not I, I won't I don't want to tolerate you know holding it up because it, it is I think it's probably I think it's partially an economic issue and one that keeps the city this keeps the city competitive and I want to make sure we're moving in that direction I will make a motion to lay it over four weeks just to give the, ta the, the task force time to operate and, and finish its work uh, but at the end of the day I, I, I'm going to be looking forward to seeing something that yeah. that we can pass that that will keep our city competitive well I, I will follow up if I haven't heard anything from people by the end of this week I'll make sure I follow up and, and by the end of this week or early next week so that we do continue to have the discussion thank you I appreciate that um, with that I make a motion to lay over for four weeks Second. Thompson Festerson, yes. Gray, yes. Jerem, yes. Mulligan, yes. Stothard, yes. Mr. President, it's laid over four weeks. Now, item number 43, an ordinance to amend Chapter 34-332-334-176 to allow 48 hours for removal of snow and ice from adjacent sidewalks to provide for special assessments to cover the city's cost of removing ice and snow placed in the streets by property owners to regulate on-street parking during snow emergencies. You have an A, B, C, D amendments and we just received an E amendment. Thank you Mr. President and I'm trying not to dominate much here I just have a couple of questions and and someone from Public Works um, that works on this. I had a um, a lady raised a question to me yesterday and I want to pose it to you today okay let's assume in, in several portions of my district in district 2 northeast section of the city there are streets where you can only there are only there are streets where you don't have any driveways on either side and you can only park on one side of the street okay okay so if we have if we have a snow that starts say in the evening and we get a forecast that says it's going to be maybe two or three inches and we end up getting 10 or 12 uh, because they miscast it and we declare a snow emergency the next day okay okay now those people who are parked on let's say it's the even side of the street and we declare a snow emergency and they have to move to the uneven side of the street how, if they live in a residential neighborhood, knowing that we're going to do the the major streets first and eventually get to those, and we want people to move to the odd side of the street, and they live on the even side of the street, and there's no place to put snow, what what happens in that event? Uh, Scott McIntyre, Public Works. I, I think you've just laid out the worst case scenario for yes. this odd even parking. Okay. Yes. Uh, what we're going to make every attempt to do is give as much notice as possible that the snow emergency is going into effect hopefully that's going to be 12 or more hours how are we going to know that we, all we can do is look at the forecast and, and, and at, usually within that 12 hour window uh, the forecast is pretty good I mean they we you know forecasters have missed um, you want me but, to tell you how many times they've missed but <laughs> go ahead uh, but, but you know that's <laughs> 
uh, that's what we're going to do. And, and when we get within about 12 hours of a fairly serious snow event and we feel we need to declare the, do declare the snow emergency because we can, <laughs> we can see when we're going to be moving into residentials, we'll do that. So people will have about 12 hours typically, uh, you know, for that first day to get out, uh, clear the snow off their car, which they're going to have to do anyway. Um, you know, get but, their but, car. Get but their my car. question is where are they going to clear it to? If you have a 12-inch snow and it's all around your car and it's on both sides of the street and they don't have driveways, where are they going to clear it to? The, the snow on the car? Yeah, you can get it off the car, but you can't get it off the street because you haven't plowed the street. Right. What do they do? I, I, I'll, I'll acknowledge that that's going to be a problem, but that's a problem now. That's a problem now. If, if we go down that street now, we'll end up creating a windrow along that line of cars. As those cars pull out, they pull snow back out into the area that's already plowed. Um, it's, it's a problem now. Uh, I, I'm, I'll, I'll admit that you know, this, this doesn't solve that problem, um, but that problem exists uh, under almost any uh, you know, emergency snow parking plan. Yeah, but the only difference now is that we're going to charge people $50 who won't be able to move in any direction, and some of these people are elderly, and that's my concern. What do we do about that? Um, you know, certainly uh, we have the option to exercise some discretion under extreme weather conditions um, and, and not issue tickets where we feel it's unfair. We're not certainly obligated to go out and ticket every single car that's in violation of the of the snow emergency parking ban. Okay. Um, but if we codify it, what what well, how do we determine how who who makes the determination when and when it's not okay to issue tickets and how do we get that information to officers who would be issuing those tickets? Uh, it'll be public works uh, employees who are involved in the snow operation who are issuing tickets. And just as we do now, we'll have, you know, we have conversations internally within the department. If it's a major event, we're talking to the mayor's office and, and talk to the staff there to discuss some of the, the, to discuss the plan and the policies that we're going to be following. Uh, and if that situation arises, um, you know, we always have the option of going out to the public and, and explaining that under these extreme circumstances, you know, we may not be ticketing for 24 hours. I'm not saying we're going to do that, but that's certainly an option that we have. Okay. Second question. What if they don't pay? Um, what's, I, what's our fallback plan? I, I assume the situation is the same that we have today uh, when people do not pay uh, after after multiple tickets, um, they fall into our scoff law category, and uh, we have the option to go out there and, and tow, and uh, um, you know they have to pay the outstanding tickets and get their car back. Okay, so so we would pop, we would possibly first of all we're going to take the poorest of the poor and we're going to charge them fifty dollars, and then if they if we have to tow them because they can't pay or won't pay, then, then, then they're going to add the charge of them in a storage lot. The, the goal of this is not to be punitive, although I, I understand if you're the one with the ticket in your hand, that's the way you see it. Um, our thought, again, was to uh, get the cars off the street so that one entire side of the street could be plowed um, and we wouldn't have to go back multiple times. You know, we could open the whole street up curb to curb and we talked about ticketing, we talked about towing, we talked about what we have to do to uh, give people incentive to comply with the parking regulations, and, and we decided that uh, ticketing, um, understanding that, you know, there's, uh, it's, it's going to be a burden on people, uh, but ticketing is the incentive to get people to, to comply with the parking regulations. Okay. Last question. Um, because this was something that someone brought to me yesterday, I'm thinking now that there's some other things that we as council members and others may not have thought of. Is there an appeal process or will there be one? For the tickets? Yeah, for the tickets. I mean, if you got a ticket and there is a legitimate issue that they face, 
uh, during these snow emergencies and there's a legitimate issue or there's an, a, leg a legitimate reason for why they did not um, they did not follow the rules so to speak is there an appeal process the, the, the or city, will there be one the city prosecutor can waive tickets and uh, maybe Paul should uh, answer that question okay I'll, I'll ask the city attorney is there an, okay. is there or should there be an appeal process if so how do we set it up is um, there a mechanism for um, if there's a good reason to um, take away the ticket Paul Kratz, City Attorney. Uh, currently, under our ticking, ticketing situation, be the same for this. Um, if somebody disputes a ticket, a uh, parking ticket, for example, they can submit in writing uh, their reasons why they should not be, or why the ticket should be waived, and it will be up to the prosecuting department to decide whether or not to waive that ticket. Um, and that's the extent of any type of an appeal. Could, could we, um, Mr. Kratz, again, could we, would, could there be an appeal through, like, maybe the Public Works Committee so that the council has an opportunity to look at it as well? Uh, no, not once a ticket is written. It, it really becomes a, I guess, quasi-criminal matter, and it goes to the prosecution. Okay. Um, Thank you. That answers my question, and but and that makes me, this a little bit up. more difficult to support. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Go let ahead. Me back up a little bit more. You know, t we, you're kind of looking at this off the cuff to the extent that um, maybe there's some way to do it. I mean, we haven't thought about it, but my initial reaction is no. It has to go to the prosecutor, and and they're you know they can be generous, and uh, they do dismiss a number of tickets. Okay. Um, thank you. That answers my questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. President. And I think Councilmember Gray uh, asked some important implementation questions, and I think that just reinforces the notion we've all had that we better make sure if we do a new plan here, we have a robust communications plan that explains all this. And I think Councilman Jeremy may talk about that here in a minute and, and may even have an, a, an, an amendment on that to address that specifically. But I think it was also Councilmember Gernant that said, boy, given the snow emergency, emergencies we had last year, uh, folks were asking about a better way of removing snow in those instances. And I think he's right about that. So I'm willing to consider some proposed changes to how we've been doing things, uh, similar to what you've been talking about the last several weeks. But I think if we do that, we better make sure we include a few of these amendments that are here today from the council. Because for the most part, this plan targets uh, an emphasis on eastern Omaha given the density of the neighborhoods and the narrowness of the streets and all that entails when it comes to a big snowfall. So I think most of these amendments are tailored to, to address certain issues we've identified in that regard. And I, I believe I'll be supporting all of these should we move forward with something here today. And, and the first one is addressing the issue of no parking on one side of the street. If you're alternating sides of the streets during a snow emergency, you better have a provision that allows people to park on the other side of the street so they have somewhere to go. The second one would be we, in this proposed ordinance, it moves the sidewalk um, shoveling expectation back to 48 hours versus 24 hours. But I think there's a substantial feeling that we better keep the expectation at 24 hours because people should be clearing their, their sidewalks within a day's worth of a snow fall for those that must use sidewalks for kids going to school, all those, all those reasons. Uh, but the one I wanted to talk about specifically and that I, I think I'll move here in a minute is a floor amendment that I'm introducing to address how we handle business districts as well. We uh, currently essentially do this in practice, but the proposed ordinance as written would have made pushing snow to the middle of a business district a potential penalized event uh, by saying people can't do that anymore. So I think it's important for item D to be approved today that allows any downtown improvement district or business improvement district like we have here today, Benson, for example, that's on our agenda here in a minute, allows them to continue their current practice, which is pushing snow to the middle, the city collects it, and it allows those businesses to do that within 24 hours of a major snow so that we can get that snow out efficiently. It allows, uh, it does not allow for the buildup and the problems we have sometimes having to go back in and take out with backhoes or further costs to the, to the property by themselves. <coughs> as long as they have that agreement ahead of time with Public Works through their BID or DID 
or further expansions in the future, such as conversations with Dundee right now or possibly even Florence that I know you're having some conversations about. So to me, I think it would be important we do include this specifically in this ordinance so there is that provision for those business districts as they seek to continue their business and, and create the jobs they have in those areas. So with that, uh, I'm sure there will be further comments on all these amendments and, and the ordinance itself, but I want to go ahead and move Amendment D. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jerem? Yes. Um, this winter that we've had with, in the past was nearly uh, or just over four feet of snow, I think, is really what brought to light um, the call by the public in droves to improve our system. And I want to thank you and, and Mr. Stubbe for, you know, taking the time to sit down and coming up with what you thought might be the best way to approach this and um, indulge us in our input in, in trying to help you do that. And representing the uh, part of the city like others on the council where we have uh, more metropolitan areas as well as narrower streets, uh, many of which are parking on only one side of the street and no parking on the other side of the, the street for block, literally sections of blocks at a time, and even places where there are no driveways. It was critically important to us to have the amendment which would allow in the declaration of a snow emergency the shifting on the odd even um, days to the side of the street that corresponds with the, the property address. And so that is basically what Amendment A's intent was, is to to alleviate that. I also, in that most, I think, metropolitan part of the city where numerous people daily traverse the sidewalks to access um, major employers, um, shopping areas, uh, to access their bus, they walk to and from work. It was important for me in this district, and I appreciate others uh, understanding that to have the 24-hour rule retained. And last winter I received lots of um, communications from constituents that were unable to walk the sidewalks because they hadn't been cleared, which then forced them out onto the streets at times. Um, I understand your efforts to um, pursue enforcement and then eventually clearing them and billing the property owner, and I know that will continue, so I appreciate mm -hmm. um, that effort. And then the final amendment, we'll call this one E, was to echo the sentiment of others like the council president who understood that in, in having heard from many constituents that unless you really have an essential um, sophisticated communication plan, you're going to have chaos where people won't know what to do and when to do it. And so there's going to be a period of time before it, people get acclimated to the change in how the new program works. And so Amendment E, and I don't know if it got out to you, I, I think it got to the level behind Yeah, me. no, I know what it is. But it would basically require the Public Works Department to develop, implement, and execute a communication plan in conjunction with a snow emergency declared pursuant to this section, which may include but not be limited to public awareness and education news media alerts, automatic calling to citizens, text and email alert systems, Twitter and other social media campaigns, and internet web-based alert and information systems, as well as our expectation that you can develop such a plan in a fiscally prudent manner, but to the extent that you might need supplemental appropriation to come back to us, and, and, and I'm sure we'll be reasonable uh, with you in order to carry that out, because it's so critical to getting the message out is how this will work, not just ahead of time, but then during the events. And I had numerous people say, hey, where can I sign up for a text alert or an email alert? And if, and if the public works could blast the, a message out, uh, wouldn't that be great to help spread the word? Um, so I would move I, uh, amendments A, B, and E. We have a motion on the floor to move Amendment D at the moment. Okay. Well, I'll wait and then. Can we take these ones? Actually, the easiest way would be to start with A, do A, do B, do C, D, and E, one at a time, and 
you but that's up to the council. Do you need a second on D? Or? Well, we can if you want. Or we can start with A and just move down the li list. We do have a second on D? Okay. That's fine, too. Yeah, that's fine. D is the amendment that you just introduced. Is that correct? Okay. Okay. That's the BIDs. Anything else, Mr. Chairman? Thank you. Mrs. Stothard? All right, now we got to Thank you. Yes, just quickly, um, I do support all the amendments, and particularly Councilman Jerome's, because I think that the communication is just is critical. But um, even so, I think today it's really important to stress, because there is some confusion, that this plan is only for snow emergencies. And if we stop and think about all the snow we had last winter, there was only one snow emergency that was declared. So it's not just a small snow, it's not just any day, but it's when we declare a snow emergency is when this new plan goes into effect. And it also is for east of 72nd Street. And so anything west of 72nd Street, this doesn't pertain to either. And I think those two things are really important to, to stress and understand as we go forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, but that doesn't mean as we progress in this whole thing that... Uh, we fully realize that the city boundaries don't stop at 72nd Street, and these things can continue to go on because uh, we're certainly not going to have uh, uh, any time, and as long as we're on this green earth, uh, uh, not have any snowstorms in Nebraska somewhere. And I'm sure Omaha is going to be included. Um, oh, Mr. Gray, you're like well, just one more. Thank you, Mr. President. One more quick question: How did how did we arrive at fifty dollars for a fine? Was was there a method for how we arrived at that uh, Scott McIntyre Public Works um, didn't have a formula to come up with that number I think the feeling was fifty dollars would uh, would provide the incentive uh, for people to come out and, and move their car when it needed to be moved uh, I think the parking tickets uh, um, if, if you violate a meter is uh, 16 and for some snowstorms, for 16 bucks, people might not want to go out and move their car. It might be worth it to them. So, you know, we're trying to, to get that figure up there enough so that it would provide that incentive to, to comply with the parking regulations. I, I would want to consider a floor member to reduce that to $25 for the first time and $50 for the second time. Second. Uh, we have a motion on the floor. We can't have. We have a motion on the floor. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it when. That's fine. Order, but yeah. can still support it. Yeah. I'll, I'll make it at the appropriate time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Jerem. You can make your second. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Thompson. Mr. McIntyre, please. For the record, there are some people in West Omaha that need to know and they need to hear from you the reason why this plan is uh, just east of 72nd. Uh, you told us, but I'd like for you to tell the public. Well, um, last winter, the, the vast majority of the problems that we had with uh, cars parked on the street and, and uh, you know, the difficulty that creates in clearing the street were east of 72nd. Certainly, you know, all the cooperation we can get from folks throughout the city to get cars uh, off the streets when we're plowing, um, you know, to pull them into a driveway or, or you know, any place um, to allow us to clear the streets, um, you know, is, is a good practice and we appreciate that cooperation. Uh, but the feeling was that um, in enforcing this throughout the city, uh, you know, first of all, there's a burden and a cost to that, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't worth that cost uh, to to go throughout the city uh, in locations where the cars on the street did not present a significant problem uh, during our plowing efforts. So a combination of cost, at least for cost at this time, and then the fact that the the bigger problems are east of 72nd, that's your rationale? Yes. And then the uh, president said that perhaps in the future we can look at expanding. Um, is that true that that's open? 
that we will take a we could look look at that in the future. Yeah, certainly. If if uh, if there's a sense that there's some value to changing the boundary um, for this uh, odd even parking plan, and there's support for it, uh, we would support that. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Scott, don't leave. My turn. Okay. Uh, in a perfect world. Um, the snow would be pushed to the center of the street and uh, public works would come along and pick it up and take it away, right? Yes, in a perfect world. In a yes. perfect world. But in reality, you have to put the snow somewhere. And my point being, is, and, and, and with this plan in a residential area, it's curb to curb. And that causes sometimes uh, maybe some snow on sidewalks and blocked driveways, correct? Uh, that is correct. That's that's a that's something we struggle with on almost every uh, snow plowing operation. Okay. Um, and I would just like to uh, my colleagues to indulge me if I could uh, go a little bit farther on Mr. Gray's example uh, about um, senior citizens that have a buried car out on the street can't get it out and all of that. <clears throat> All of your trucks are uh, equipped with two-way radios, is that right? Uh, that's correct. And they, uh, those plow drivers uh, have the opportunity to contact their street foreman at any time during a plowing operation, is that correct? That's, that's correct. Okay, and then that foreman has the flexibility to m make some decisions of whether or not to send a truck back to make a second or even a third pass from a street. Is that, is that fairly accurate? Um, yes, yes. Okay. And one of the, the proposals today in regards to towing, ticketing and towing basically are going to be the last resort, but we need it in the law to make that happen. Accurate? The, again, in the perfect world, everyone would comply with the odd even parking regulations mm -hmm. without uh, any further incentives from us. So towing would be the absolute last resort that you would want to do um, if we had a, uh, a significant to a major snowstorm. That's correct. Okay. I, I hope that gives a, a little sense of what's happening out there that public works is, uh, we all have senior citizens in our, in our area that would have, would have maybe similar problems. But I, I'd just like the, the public to know that public works does have some flexibility out there with some technology that if this is brought to their attention, you know, they've got human beings making the decision out there that there's a possibility that there can be something that's being done and that they're doing that. And that's, uh, I, I, I want to give them credit because you all busted your tail ends during that major snowstorm that we had last season. and. Uh, uh, I, I, I appreciate it. Even though that uh, we took some direct hits, uh, you all took a lot of direct hits, uh, but we're still here. Yeah, and thank we're you. Still going to go, Mr. Gray. Um, and I just want to be clear, Mr. I, if if there's if 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 you if you do have that kind of flexibility, and I know you do, um, Scott. I'm just wondering if there isn't a. I mean, when you talk to when when you talk back to the foreman and so forth. If, like I said, if my scenario plays out and there's no place for them to go, just plow the other side of the street and then move them over. I mean, and just have them move over, you know, something like that. I mean, the, the flexibility to do that even, I think, would, would be beneficial. I'm, tr you, I, I'm trying to balance with, you know, the because I've been a big proponent of the fact that, that public works is, had, doesn't have enough people, doesn't have enough equipment, doesn't have enough mechanics, doesn't have enough other things that I thought we should have raised the raise taxes to get that money and everybody knows that and I'm on record for it so you know having said that I'm trying to balance that with the poorest of the poor that I represent and and certainly that's the common sense approach to the scenario <clears throat> yes. you laid out but you know without knowing everything else that's going on at the time that situation ar arises it's difficult to commit and say absolutely this is what we're going to do under those circumstances because I know when we've got 12 inches of snow on the ground, there's a lot of things going on, and it's difficult to uh, commit resources to any one particular situation. And, Mr. President, I know common sense is going to prevail for most of this. 
and I and I was not questioning your. No, no. Uh, okay. I, I was just trying to let the general public know. Uh, we have no further light, uh, Mr. Clerk. Uh, uh, we we have a motion. We have to a motion on floor. Approve amendment number D. D. And a second. And a second. D is the BID okay. issue. Okay, no further light. Motion and a second. Roll call on D. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. May we go to A now? Would that be okay, council members? Yes. Do we have a motion for A? And A is parking on the streets where there's no parking. Roll call. Okay. We got a motion and a second. And no lights, roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. That is approved. Do we have a motion on amendment B? B. That's, that's a toe. That's the toe. Okay. He's a moving can we, can we get B out of the way? <laughs> B is, B is the the last resort for, for towing. Move B. B. We got a, a motion, a second on B, and that's the towing. Mike's tow. roll call. Thompson. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Jerem. Yes. Mulligan. Yes. Stothard. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Now C. Roll call. That is the 24 hours. 24 hour. instead of 48. Thompson? No. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? No. It is adopted on a 5 to 2 vote. Second. Roll call. Thompson? Uh, yeah, I was one of the first to bring this up, so I'm going to support it, yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Uh, does Mr. Gray? Mr. Gray, you have your light on. Proposed amendment F, and amendment F would be... Um, if, if there are fines, that the fine be initially $25 for the first offense and $50 for any offense after that. We have a motion and a second for a tiered fine of 25, first offense 50 for subsequent. No further lights. Roll call. Thompson? I agree with it, yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. As amended. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's passed as amended 7 to 0. Pursuant to City Council Rule 70, the public hearing agenda items 44 through 46 shall be held on third reading. Ordinance on second reading, item 47, ordinance to amend Class A final liquid storage district, A131 at 4334 South 67th Street. Public hearing on item number 47 begins now. Are there any proponents? Any opponents? Public hearings closed. Next item. Item 48, ordinance to establish a new Class A final local storage district, A147 at 5522 Lindbergh Drive. Public hearing on item number 48 begins now. Are there any proponents? Any opponents? Public hearings closed. Next item. Item 49, ordinance to accept the bid of Ed M. Feld to provide gloves, boots, and helmets for the Omaha Fire Department. Public hearing on item number 49 begins now. Are there any proponents? Tim Book, Omaha Fire. Myself and Battalion Chief Scott Bauman are here to answer any questions you might have about item 49. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Any opponents? Public hearing's closed. Resolutions, item number 50, resolution then pursuant to the provisions of the Business Improvement District Act. Uh, and based on the recommendations of the Benson Business Improvement District Board, the City of Omaha Planning Board, the City 
Council of the City of Omaha hereby declares its intention to create business improvement district number 6875 in Benson. Public hearing on item number 50 begins now. Are there any proponents? Uh, yes. Uh, Bernard Indenbosch, Assistant City Attorney. And I guess the primary reason I wanted to appear is just kind of let you know what the process is, is this is the first step in a couple of step process. There has been a business improvement district in Benson uh, since 1977. It is still active. Uh, I was approached, I think actually Councilman Pesterson was approached some time ago. I was brought in some time ago also uh, about some efforts to change and expand what that business improvement district was able to do. What you have before you is a resolution of intention. This, uh, the Business Improvement Board spent a lot of time, and I know secured a lot of input from the community, as putting together what they wanted to do and what they <coughs> wanted to do in the future. Uh, they have submitted that to the Planning Board. The Planning Board made a recommendation in favor of it. The first step by statute uh, is to come to this particular council with a resolution of intention to create the BID. This action doesn't actually create the BID. It allows for a public hearing by every, anybody who's interested uh, to appear and to make their case. It, it does allow also um, an opportunity if there are people in the community that are opposed to it to submit a written protest by 50 percent of the accessible units and if such a petition were received uh, the BID would effectively be would end. Uh, you couldn't pursue it. It would not be pursued anymore. This particular BID expands the boundaries of the current Benson BID, obviously expands the duties. Uh, as you'll note from this particular document, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the method in which to finance the Business Improvement District. It uses a special assessment, which is the mechanism typically used by Business Improvement Districts to raise money. In this particular uh, case, uh, they've used its $2.50 per $1,000 of assessed value. Uh, that's the assessment mechanism that's proposed. Uh, after this hearing, hopefully you'll you'll vote and, and vote in favor of it. The next step of the process is you will there will be an ordinance brought to this council, which will actually then effectively create uh, the BID and give them the ability to do those things uh, that are uh, within the duties uh, anticipated. If at any point in time when they actually want to come to get money and assess money against the members of the Business Improvement District, that particular assessment document will also have to come to the Council. Uh, what, what's anticipated, what typically happens with most of the smaller BIDs, unlike the downtown one which we see each year, but the smaller BIDs, uh, typically uh, the BID does those items that are under their, uh, the, the duties they're allowed to do. Uh, the City has typically uh, helped them with contracting, coordinating, uh, and advance the costs then build those costs to the members of the community, uh, and if the costs aren't recovered, then the city is an ability to assess the members of that improvement district uh, for uh, the funds that they're obligated to pay. And that's been the typical mechanism. Uh, there may be some testimony that, and not in all cases, maybe some people haven't been assessed, and it, it's possible, I suppose. I'm not familiar with the history of the Benson Improvement District other than I know it exists and I kind of know what it's supposed to do. I'll try not to do that again. Um, but um, it, it may be if there's one or two people that don't pay in the amount uh, to go forward, it hasn't been collected, um, or maybe there have been contributions, donations received in order to, to finance it, but I know uh, these things have typically occurred through the Parks uh, Department. Uh, Walt Mertz in particular has worked with the Benson and the Dundee Business Improvement Districts currently. So it's a little different animal than the Downtown Business Improvement District where you're used to seeing that ordinance each year. Uh, but I just wanted to give a little bit of background. This is step one. They will be back again, will be back again before you actually create uh, the, the district. And in that particular document, if you want to put in some specific rules or regulations, we can do that. That's what happened with the downtown. There were specific some safeguards put in in the actual ordinance that created it. Um, you know, if, if that's something that the council feels needs to be done, that can obviously be done. So, with that being said, I'll sit down and let the people of who are very much interested in the area speak their piece. Thank you. Any other proponents? 
Good afternoon. My name is Greg Bourne. I own Burke's Pub, 61, or excuse me, 6117 Maple Street. I'm a current BID member uh, in Benson and a longtime business owner. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, talking to us this afternoon. I'm here to support the new BID. I think that the uh, this is something that our uh, community has been working on for almost a year. Uh, we've held monthly, bi-weekly, and weekly meetings. I never knew there were so many meetings involved with city government, so I can amend you people. But it's just amazing. We've had a great input uh, from all our neighbors and our fellow business owners uh, about what we want to go on for the Benson Business Improvement District and some of the changes we want. Again, this is just changes. We do have a BID in place at the moment. I think by passing the BID, uh, the new BID, we will have local control uh, of some of these issues that we have. And I think, very honestly, I think we'd have a stronger and uh, more uh, faster response time in dealing with some of our snow issues, uh, some of our uh, other issues that we face up there. We have uh, worked up a, uh, a work plan that's in the, uh, in the bill or that. One of the nice things is that we really want to be able to do uh, with these changes is not to have to come to the city all the time for money. The, there is ways that now we cannot apply for federal grants or, or national grants or business grants because of the way that BID is structured we can apply for that in the future. And so that's going to lessen the burden on the city and our neighbors and our community. I really think that uh, by approving this, uh, we will make our neighborhood stronger. We've had lots of input. We've had uh, public meetings at uh, our local churches, our local restaurants, in our businesses. Uh, we've invited everyone in the, uh, the BID to these meetings and to our public, uh, uh, public meetings and our weekly meetings. And we've had a real strong re response. And I truly believe that this is very good for our neighbors, our city, uh, and Benson. Thank you. Thank you. Next proponent. I'm Mark Goodall. I have a business at 6104 Maple Street. Uh, I've been on the BID steering committee and am president of the Benson Business Association. Uh, we, I have obviously attended the meetings, as Greg has discussed, uh, but we have also carried that information back to the meetings of the Benson Business Association. Uh, from my professional and personal point of view, uh, what I like that is happening in Benson, and we've always been hoping Benson's back, where are we? Uh, of late, though, I'm finding that the uh, people in their late 20s and early 30s into their 40s are discovering or rediscovering Benson. What I hope happens with the Benson Neighborhood Association, the Business Association, and the BID is that we will continue to maintain strong funded infrastructure so that those people that are at uh, readings, at art events, at uh, music events and business events and are saying, Benson's cool, we really like Benson, this is part of that infrastructure. We need to do that. Thank you. Next proponent. Hi, uh, Zoe Baumel. I represent the, I'm a property manager and I represent the Hulak family that owns property along that area. I would like to say that anything that we can do that will beautify that area is long overdue. I've seen the proposals uh, that include brickwork, trees, litter control, those kinds of things. And so on behalf of the Hulaks, I'm a proponent. Thank you. Next proponent. Good afternoon, Honorable President and Council. My name is Liz Moldenhauer. I live at 2345 North 64th Street. I'm the president of the Benson Neighborhood Association, and I am in support of the BID process. Um, the major entities, as has been described by um, Mark Goodall, are here today because we believe that there is some great progress in development for Benson. But we need to be able to utilize this BID um, in order to continue that process. We all have a stake in the, in the success of downtown Benson, and I hope you support us in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. Next proponent. 
Bill Carmichael, 6201 Maple. Uh, I'm a fairly recent property owner in the Benson neighborhood, and uh, I think this, along with like the, uh, T the TIF funding that has been designated, I think these are very strong uh, tools that help persons like myself uh, revitalize the area, and so I'm here to support it. Thank you. Next proponent. Uh, Mr. President and Council, uh, my name is Troy Arthur, uh, 3306 Avenue D, Council Bluffs. Um, I am uh, the current chairman of the Benson Names Alliance, um, and I also represent uh, Bank of the West, who's one of the large uh, parcels or property holders there in uh, the Benson BID. Um, actually, in the proposed new BID, in the last one, we have never been assessed before, and yet we do um, uh, receive some of the benefits of the current BID. Uh, I just want to put uh, forth our support uh, from both those uh, entities uh, for this new proposal to create this thriving and uh, just wonderful retail district there in Benson. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Any opponents? Hi, my name is Chris McGrath. I'm a property owner, business owner in Benson. I just received this letter about what's going on here and took it across the street. I'm on military, not on Maple Street. I'm on the edge of this bid district. Uh, they have not been notified of this. Uh, didn't know anything about it. Uh, I, th I think everybody inside that area that surrounds this district where they have it the mapped in area everybody should be aware of what's going on not just the people main people up on maple street which has turned into more of a nightclub area than uh bringing in businesses and uh, i pro i think there should be more talk on this it should not just be accepted today i don't know if that's what you're doing or not but uh i'm against i'm against it uh and i talked to some people today Greg Bourne, uh, for one, is explaining a few things to me, but I don't think there's enough on the table and not, not enough of us property owner, business owners that are up there have been notified so that we can participate in this and have a say in uh, this because what this is is just going to cost us or me being a business owner up there more money on things that have already should be taken care of from the city, uh, snow removal and stuff, uh, lighting, uh, trash pickup. A lot of this money I guess I've been paying into this bid uh, over the last few years, uh, I have seen no improvements in my end of the part of the town. I see upstreet, uh, uptown is what it used to be called. When you went shopping, you either went uptown, that was Benson, or you went downtown, which we shopped downtown. And uh, I think as long as I'm being included in this that I should have uh, some of the say in what's going on. I do see some improvements up in the upper on Maple Street. Uh, they have planters that were bought for themselves and benches and uh, trash receptacles and stuff. I don't see them coming down any of the air, uh, area that my business is in. Uh, I'm, I'm all for beautifying Benson. I've lived in that community for 55 years. My grandparents grew up there in 32. We've been there forever. Uh, I just don't like to see it turning into a nightclub all night area where, where that's why some of the security problems you have, people roaming the streets till two in the morning because of all the bars being open. I'd like to see some businesses remain there rather than just turn into a, a a bar scene at night and that's where we get the security problems where we get the trash problems and I guess that's all I have to say right now but I'm against it until it, it's clarified and more of the owners like the neighbors across the street on military from me are notified about some of this stuff so that they could be here and either agree or disagree but that's what I have to say today thank you thank you are there any other opponents Public hearings closed. Mr. Festerson. Thanks, Mr. President. I just want to thank the tes testifiers that are here today for all their work. I know they've worked hard on this over the last uh, year or so uh, with this proposal. I want to thank Law and Planning, too. I know they're involved in many of these meetings as well. And to get, get us to this point, 
and the Benton Ames Alliance. I think we wouldn't be here without that initiative as well. So I appreciate them all being here and all testifying. I am supportive of what we're doing here today. I think it's another example of uh, Benson being on the move. I'm particularly fond of some of the things Mr. Bourne mentioned this will do in terms of improving security, improving lighting and maintenance issues, as well as the snow plowing issue we talked about earlier in the meeting. I think that will <coughs> improve business in the Benson Business District and is complementary to the Tax Increment Financing District we approved just recently. The $1.4 million in infrastructure investment that will happen uh, by the city and Benson in the next several years. And even the Omaha Bike Patrol we initiated this summer uh, to, to keep uh, businesses safe and, and moving in the right direction. Mr. Bourne, could I ask you just a couple questions that were posed there? Gregory Bourne, 6117 Maple. Thanks. Uh, just in terms of the communications to the merchants, you're a current president of the BID, and I know we have Mr. Goodall, who's the current president of the Business Association in Benson, and I know that we've had lots and lots of public meetings on this. You, you guys have actually gone door to door to businesses to discuss this plan. There's been two or three mailed public notices by the city and by the Benson Ames Alliance on the plan. Can you talk about that a little more? Yes, thank you. Uh, I do know that uh, uh, the Business Association and uh, their monthly notices have uh, put in at least three uh, notices about our uh, the changes in the BID and two of their the meetings that was our main topic uh, of the uh, Business Association lunch that day was the changes in the BID. Uh, we have had uh, on May the 20th uh, a public uh, a letter going to the public of everyone that was uh, in the new uh, proposed BID. We uh, had that meeting at Benson Baptist and it was very well uh, attended. We've had a number, a number of articles uh, from the World Herald. Uh, one thing that uh, we have done uh, you know, personally, members of the board and members of the uh, uh, of the committee for the changes is we all had uh, a list of personal contacts we, we made. Some were by email, which isn't really that personal, but some that was the only way we could get uh, to some of the folks that own property. I know, Chris, we I did not speak to you until today, and I do apologize for that, but it was never trying to keep someone out of the loop. Uh, I personally thought there was a lot of information uh, out about uh, the BID. Uh, I've definitely uh, invited uh, Chris McGrath to any of the meetings. Uh, our next one is next Friday uh, at my place at 8 in the morning. Uh, we really try to get the community's input. Uh, it, uh, in the past, he is right. Uh, we have not uh, done the best job for Benson. Uh, the BID was very weak, uh, and the members weren't as involved as we should be. We really believe uh, in our hearts that this is going to change. Uh, we know this is the only way for Benson to improve itself. We don't have all the answers, and that's why we've had almost a year's worth of public meetings and asking our neighbors and our community what they want and what is good for them. I, there is one thing that I will say that at all of these meetings, it has always been said is, if we are expanding the footprint of the BID, everything, the side streets, everything must get the same attention as Maple Street. We don't want to exclude someone that's on, on one side of on one side or the other. Uh, we want this, I, we want our community back the way it used to be 15, 20 years ago. And as far as the nightlife, yes, there is a lot of nightlife in Benson. That's another thing that the, this committee has been pushing for is to infill with small businesses. We don't think that liquor and entertainment is what Benson needs to be. We wanted a strong, vibrant retail community as well. There's been uh, a gentleman, the Silver of Oz. Uh, he moved from one end of Benson uh, down, if you will, towards more of the entertainment areas, and his business has grown exponentially. He's also open evenings when the crowd is there, and sometimes that's what it takes, is to adapt to the current situation. And I really believe that this BID will modernize us and bring Benson back. Thanks. Thank you. And I agree with all that, and I think there there is also ongoing opportunity for additional communication and conversation with merchants between today's action and the actual ordinance. And, and on top of that, moving forward in a fairly flexible plan for that input, and I, I know you worked hard on that. 
because I've been there for most of those meetings. <laughs> Another thing that uh, uh, the, uh, the committee wanted to do is once this was passed is uh, we are expanding two seats on the board and we want everyone in the community, in the Benson community, to have input on who should be on that board. We, of course, recommend it to uh, our councilman who recommends it to the mayor, and then it's up to you. But we don't want to pick somebody. We want the community to pick them. And that way we have a stronger board and things will get done. Great, thanks. Thank you. So with that, I, I, mean, I continue to believe this is a good, uh, good idea for Benson, another positive step forward. It will help us uh, with the business district will help us create jobs. And I think we'll have further conversation about this when the ordinance comes back in several weeks, but I think it's in pretty good shape here and, and deserves a, a vote forward here today. And I, I move that approval. Second. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, uh, is it your office's responsibility of sending out notifications? Uh, Buster Brown City Clerk, that's correct. We sent out approximately somewhere between 150 and 200 to all property owners within the district itself. Okay. And that's to everything that you have uh, access to being via public records, via the boundaries of this particular district. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Mr. Indenbosch? Bernard Indenbosch, Assistant City Attorney. What, what I did is I was given the boundaries uh, by the, uh, the Business Improvement Board, and I took that provided it to Public Works. And actually, Public Works, before Harold Flatone uh, left, uh, they went through and identified each and every property owner in that area. We got the address from the public records. Uh, I provided that information to the city clerk. And they were each provided a full copy of the resolution of intention, that document that is before you today that outlines many of the things that this BID intends on doing. So they actually get a full copy of this particular document that's required to be sent out at least 10 days prior to this public hearing. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that the record was clear that uh, the rules were being followed. And uh, it, it does bother me when uh, neighbors do come up and say that uh, they had no clue what was going on. So the, the rules were followed. We have promises here today that uh, that is going to be expanded, and that's good news to me. That makes me feel good. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, that I've known that I've worked with uh, in the Benson area, and that's the Omaha Coalition of Citizens Patrols. Liz, can I have you come back for a minute, since you're the president of the Neighborhood Association? Liz Moldenhauer, 2345 North 64th Street. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Benson uh, Citizens Patrol. Uh, you are? Yes. All right, great. Uh, that makes this uh, statement a little bit easier than uh, you probably know that that went inactive uh, due to the fact that uh, it's currently unfortunately suffered a series of strokes and uh, uh, has not been able to put the time in uh, at all uh, since that has happened and the patrol has uh, become inactive. I would like you uh, uh, to give me some assurance that uh, you'll certainly look into this and try to do whatever the neighborhood association can to get that revitalized. Uh, it, it it made significant progress. Uh, I know I'm actively involved in that organization as a volunteer. Uh, would you be willing to say yes? I will, Gary, to take a look and see if you can get that revitalized. Definitely. In fact, uh, I'd like to expand on that. Uh, one of the things the Benson Neighborhood Association is doing um, in order to better serve neighbors, uh, not just our members, but in the neighborhood, is we're working on committees. And one of those committees has been discussed as being the Citizens Patrol so that we can revitalize, so we can pass the information along to people so that they understand what the Citizens Patrol process is, um, commitment. And then so that we also uh, not just have the buy-in, but we have a continual support of citizen patrol members. It, it certainly uh, provides that extra eyes and ears for public safety. And there's nothing better than uh, having a trained neighbor helping a neighbor. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Festerson? I agree with your statements. And I know the intention is to redo that. And, and in fact, it's more than an intention. It's in the plan you have before you here today. It's part of our idea with security to partner with 
our vitalized uh, neighborhood patrol, citizens patrol system in Benson. So um, I think it is something we've considered and something we'll do. Thank you. No further lights. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's adopted 7 to 0. Uh, landfill will take 51 and 52 together. We just need a motion for setting the public hearing. Uh, 51 is resolution of the application of Hawkins Construction Company for expansion of the limited refuge and demolition debris landfill at 60th and Q Street is approved. And 52 is the site approval pursuant to the Nebraska statutes is hereby granted. We need a motion to lay over three weeks to October 19th for publication of public hearing. Second. No lights, roll call. Thompson? Yes. Patterson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's laid over and publications <coughs> and public hearing set 7 to 0. Uh, City of Omaha, uh, 53, <coughs> City of Omaha Comprehensive Annual, a financial report for fiscal year ending December 31st, 2009, prepared by KPMG LLP is hereby. Or er, is hereby. Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Placed on file 7 to 0. Pursuant to City Council Rule 7H, due to no meeting being held October 12th, the third reading on agenda item 54 shall be held on October 19th. Pursuant to City Council Rule 7C, the public hearing agenda items 55 through 60 shall be held on the second reading. Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Mulligan? Yes. Stothard? Mr. President. Yes. Thank you all. We are adjourned.